You're looking at a surgeon test a patient's anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, to make sure it's still intact. When somebody has a healthy ACL, the tibia won't move forward that much. And we know that because the knee behaves as a hinge, one of the six types of joints in the body. And just like a hinge on a door, we expect it to close and open and that's it. That one plane of motion is exactly what we want a hinge to do. But of course, that type of movement wouldn't work for how we use our shoulders or hip joints. There are multiple types of joints that let our skeleton support our squishy insides and let us move the way we move. So in this video, we're gonna go over the types of joints in the body and why the demands placed on those joints use that type of joint in particular. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Patrick, and I love getting to look at the body as a system of machines and levers. This particular lesson is usually as deep as any anatomy class gets with kinesiology or biomechanics, but if you find yourself enjoying this video, consider taking a full kinesiology class. You might like it. Before we get into the applications of each joint type, we need to be super clear about what a joint is. A joint is any time a bone meets bone, and that includes more configurations than you think. That could be a free moving joint like your elbow, but that also includes where your pubic bones and the pelvis meet, or the junctions of the flat bones of your skull. The first way that we can think of joint classification is based on their freedom of movement. Like some joints barely move at all. These are synarthroses, joints like the sutures between the flat bones of your skull or how your teeth connect to your maxilla and mandible, what's technically called gomphoses. We have these because over our lives, our anatomy grows and tweaks itself slightly, but after that anatomy matures, we want it to stay put. Amphiarthroses have slightly more mobility, but only because they have dense fibrocartilage between the two bones. This includes the fibrocartilage of your intervertebral discs and other mostly immobile joints like the pubic symphysis. This thing is really interesting in its own right, but it exists because well, we really don't want those two halves separating, but we do want a little bit of wiggle room when pushing a baby out of the birth canal. But when you talk about joints in your day to day, you're probably thinking of diarthroses, also called synovial joints, the most mobile type of joint. Usually you'll see it represented like this at first because each of the six joint types are so different. So this picture just says, here are the two bones and here's the stuff around them modify according to whatever bones you're looking at. It could just as easily show a ball and socket or a saddle joint, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's break this image down. As usual, the link is in the description if you want the next part for your notes. Synovial joints are made of two bones coated with a super smooth, glassy looking bit of connective tissue called articular cartilage. That whole thing is surrounded by a fibrous capsule that ties it together with the periosteum, the connective tissue that wraps all around the bone. Deep to that layer is the synovial membrane, which has a bunch of fibroblasts and some stem cells, and then filling the middle is synovial fluid, which has some phospholipids and glycoproteins and otherwise a good chemical environment to keep the joint moving smoothly. So in general, our example synovial joint includes the two cartilage-coated bones, a fibrous outer layer, a thinner middle layer, and special lubricating liquid inside. Cool. Now that we have the archetypal standard synovial joint, now we can transform it into the six joint types and add ligaments and muscles and all the fun stuff. First up, the plane joint. Represented as two planes sliding past each other, it's also called a gliding joint. The two bones will usually have either flat surfaces or slightly curved surfaces that barely move because of the connective tissue around them. The most well-known plane joints are the intercarpal and intertarsal joints and like, Look at all those ligaments keeping them together. They might not seem like they have a ton of motion, but they can still move a bit. Ask anyone who's dislocated their lunate before. We also see them in the facet joints between vertebrae. This is a totally different joint than the amphiarthroses, the discs I mentioned earlier. The facets are the pieces of the vertebrae that glide past each other during spinal flexion and extension, so this joint in the vertebrae is different than this joint. Next up, the pivot joint. This is where one bone is enclosed in some kind of soft tissue ring from another bone. My best example is the proximal radio ulnar joint, which you can super easily find on yourself by bending your elbow, finding your lateral epicondyle of the humerus, that big bump, then moving about an inch down the forearm. By pronating and supinating your wrist, the radial head just pops up. That flared end of the radius sits in a little groove in the ulna and held in place by a ligament called the annular ligament, which makes it a pivot joint. That's the radial ulnar joint at your elbow, but they form another joint at your wrist, which is also a pivot joint, but it's not as mobile. 
So why does this matter? Well, since we are bipedal animals, our hands and wrists evolved more recently for tool usage, and this control of pronation and supination, flipping our hands around the axis of the forearm, makes more dexterity and finesse possible. Without the pivot joints at our elbow, we'd have to rotate our arms with the clunkier shoulder movements. Also, take a look at one of the muscles that does pronation, the pronator teres at the elbow. It originates at the medial humerus and medial ulna and inserts on the lateral radius around the middle of the bone. If this muscle inserted at the medial radius, this whole joint wouldn't work. The elbow also has a hinge joint, a type of joint that just rotates around one axis. One of the bones is convex, one is concave, and the only motions this joint can do are flexion and extension, like in the elbow, tibiofemoral joint of the knee, and between the digits. Technically, hinge joints can also dorsi and plantar flex. The talocrural joint in the ankle counts as a hinge joint. I like to think of hinge joints with perspective of the big, brutish muscles that move them. Powerful muscles like the biceps and triceps brachii, or the quad and hamstring groups, or the calf muscles. These are muscles with thick, inserting tendons that you can easily palpate. Literally, sit down, drag your heel into the ground, and your hamstring tendons will make themselves known. These muscles can afford to be bulky and powerful because their joint only has one plane of motion to travel in. While they do have some stabilizers around them, they don't need extreme precision or finesse. The muscles around hinge joints just need to pull and let the constraints of the skeleton guide their motion. On the other hand, Ball and socket joints like the shoulder and hip have all kinds of degrees of freedom, more than any other type of joint. Although the socket in ball and socket can be deceptive. Take the glenohumeral joint of the shoulder, which I need to spell out because we need to differentiate it from the scapulothoracic joint, which is not a ball and socket. It's also not a true joint, but I'm going on a tangent. Anyway, within the GH, the ball of the humeral head sits in the concave socket of the glenoid fossa. Fossa just means any kind of dip in the skeleton, and this isn't a huge dip. It's more like a golf tee than a kendama. So to increase the depth of the socket, our bodies deepen it with a structure called the labrum, which blends in with the dense irregular connective tissue to form the shoulder capsule, plus another layer of more dynamic support from the muscles and tendons of the rotator cuff. In ball and socket joints, we see a greater number of smaller muscles than in hinge joints, but we still have some big movers, like the glute max, the iliopsoas, or rectus femoris are powerful muscles, but the femoroacetabular joint is much deeper than the shoulder, which makes it more stable and capable of movement from powerful muscles. It has plenty of stability built in, like a labrum of its own, muscles deep within the hip, and super strong ligaments. Not quite the full range of motion as ball and socket joints are condyloid joints, sometimes called ellipsoid joints. Basically, you have a rounded end of one bone sitting inside a little dip in another bone. It's got lots of range of motion along the long axis and a little bit along the short axis. We see this in the wrist joint, specifically where the proximal row of carpal bones makes a rounded bump and sits inside the groove made by the distal radius. That lets us do a big range of motion in flexion and extension, but only a little bit of ulnar and radial deviation. We also see it in the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Lots of flexion and extension, little bit of finger spreading. The last type of joint we have is the saddle joint. The classic example is the thumb joint, not the thumb knuckle, but the carpo metacarpal joint. Also, I never want to say the words thumb knuckle again. I just, that felt weird coming out of my mouth. Right, by using a saddle joint here, it gives us way more range of motion compared with the other carpo metacarpal joints, which are plane joints, which means they have fewer planes of motion that they can move through. This saddle joint ultimately gives us our human opposable thumbs. So we can expect a level of muscular control that matches this level of precision and finesse too. There are a few other important pieces in synovial joints that don't fit neatly into our six types of joints collection. Like some of our joints have protective bursa that give them some cushion, or they have bones in their ligaments, what are called sesamoid bones, which I'll have a video all about. And some have big chunks of fibrocartilage like the meniscus in the knee. And one more thing that's worth pointing out here is that our conventional names for joints, like the ankle, can actually be multiple joints. The ankle includes the talocrural joint, which is a hinge, and the subtalar joint, which is a gliding or plane joint. So while we usually say that the ankle can dorsiflex and plantar flex, invert and evert, as students of kinesiology, we have to consider this new layer of granularity. I bestow upon thee the title of level two anatomy student. Congrats. If you want more of these musculoskeletal and kinesiology focused videos, I've got a whole playlist of them right here. 
One of my favorites is this video about why the human spine is so terribly designed, so check that out here. Otherwise, subscribe if you learned something and hit the bell so you get notified when I post a new video. Have fun, be good. Thanks for watching.